and welcome from the LSE German Society. We're delighted to have this very interesting talk today, and I would like to thank all the panelists for coming today. Um, before we start, I would just like to give some technical guidance. Please use the Q&A function by stating your name and also maybe your back background. I hand over now to our chair, Gabriel Baunach, who is the founder of ClimAware and also the ClimAware podcast host. Yes, thank you, Leo, for the introduction and also for organizing the German Symposium and this event. And thank you in the audience for attending and participating. So welcome to the LSE German Symposium, New Beginnings, and this event, Effective Climate Policy, the Role of Carbon Capture, also from my side. Before introducing our distinguished panelists, please allow me to briefly explain why it is highly relevant and important to talk about carbon capture by reading out loud one sentence from the IPCC's special report on 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming from 2018. All pathways that limit global warming to 1.5 degrees project the use of carbon dioxide removal on the order of 100 to 1000 gigatons of CO2 over the 21st century. And to put, put this into context, currently we emit nearly 40 gigatons of CO2 per year. And according to the IPCC, we need to have negative emissions of about 10 to 20 gigatons of CO2 annually after 2050. So in light of this huge challenge, I'm delighted to welcome and introduce our speakers who work in different disciplines at the forefront of this matter. Firstly, Dr. Julio Friedman, He's a senior research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at the Columbia University. He holds degrees from the MIT and a PhD from the University of Southern California. And he's one of the world's leading experts on carbon capture and storage, CCS, as well as carbon capture and utilization, CCU, which he will probably explain later in his opening statement. So thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Friedman. Secondly, I welcome Dr. Jan Wurzbacher, founder and CEO of Climeworks, the Swiss company that sucks CO2 from the air by means of direct air capture, which he will probably also explain later in his opening statements. He's a mechanical engineer with a PhD from the renowned ETH Zurich and founded Climeworks in 2009 as a spin-off from ETH Zurich. So thank you, Dr. Wurzbacher, for joining us today as well. And thirdly, I'd like to introduce Kai Whittaker. He's a member of the German parliament and chairman, or in German, you call it Obmann. It's difficult to translate, of the CDU Union Parliamentary Group in the advisory body for sustainable development. As a politician, he wants to make sustainability more concrete so that the 17 UN sustainable development goals are considered in every lawmaking process. Thank you as well, Mr. Whittaker, for joining this panel and to bring in the political exper uh, expertise in the context of sustainability and climate change in particular. So thank you to the three of you for making the time. And now I would like to open the floor for Dr. Julio Friedman and for his opening statement and his views on carbon capture. Uh, thank you very much, Gabriel. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the uh, London School of Economics and the German program. Uh, uh, this is really a terrific opportunity and I'm delighted to share some thoughts with you on this important topic of carbon capture. Um, uh, let's start by saying that the 1.5 degree report you mentioned really shook things up. Uh, politicians and CEOs around the world realized that we had failed and that more ambition was required, that there was no way to get to a sustainable solution without uh, profound, rapid changes uh, economy-wide. And that really has prompted a reimagining uh, of the entire climate crisis and specifically around net zero. Uh, five years ago, nobody was talking about net zero as a framework. Now it is the only framework of merit. And if you're going to get to net zero, that's very clarifying. 
it means everything has to reach zero. You can't emit anything anywhere. So cement and concrete, steel, chemicals, uh, use of fertilizer in agriculture, heating buildings, it all has to go to zero. Uh, and that is daunting, but clarifying. Uh, second, any residual emissions must be balanced by removal. Uh, as you said, that's projected to be on the order of 10 gigatons by mid-century. That would be twice the size of the oil and gas industry. That is incredibly difficult. It is also an enormous market opportunity. There will be people who create that industry and thrive in it. Uh, last, it has made it very urgent. Uh, net zero has shown us that we have to move faster and farther. And that means we do not have the luxury of selecting what we like only. We really have to check all options. Every option that we have available has big challenges facing it. That is true for offshore wind, that is true for efficiency, that is true for nuclear, it is certainly true for carbon capture. That has become irrelevant. Now we just have to tackle those challenges uh, or else we're all gonna be in great difficulty. In that context, uh, CCS has emerged as one of those key pathways and an important one. In addition to the five to 10 gigatons that you mentioned in the, of removal, we're gonna have an equal volume of capture to avoid and reduce existing emissions. And the International Energy Agency has been very clear that the existing infrastructure alone will blow the carbon budget. There is no way to meet the carbon budget without either shutting down plants early or retrofitting them for CCS. Those are the only options. <laughs> and so uh, some plants will get shut down early, that's fine, but probably not all of them. When I was in the US government, among other things, I learned that the US government did not make policy in China or Russia. And so as a consequence, uh, 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 we need solutions that can work everywhere and CCS looks important. It is unfortunate that I still have to give talks about the scientific status of CCS, but I do. So there we go. And the reason I say it's unfortunate is that this is a technology that was invented in 1930. It has been operational since 1938 with the first plants in Norway. Uh, we've been using it to scrub CO2 out of the air and oceans on submarines and spacecraft since the 1940s. Uh, we have been injecting CO2 into deep geological formations since the 1970s. Uh, and currently we capture and store 40 million tons of CO2 a year. And we have captured a total of about 300 million tons. There are 21 commercial facilities worldwide with about another 50 in construction in the pipeline. Uh, those are in the advanced stages of planning or construction. 10 nations have operating commercial CCS facilities today. And 10 nations have built CCS into their nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. So the fact that we have to ask if this is scientifically possible is weird because we've been doing it at large scale for a very long time. Um, in that context, uh, the climate crisis has sharpened our pencils on this. It means that we need to really talk seriously about scale and it means that we need to talk seriously about speed. Uh, the challenge fundamentally with CCS is that we have to increase our current operations by a factor of 100. We have to go from 40 million tons a year to four gigatons a year. That is a big challenge and we have about 30 years to do it. At the same time, we have to create a roughly an equal volume in CO2 removal. Uh, and some of that will be trees, for sure. Some of that will be soils, for sure. Some of that will be becks. Some of that will be direct air capture. A lot of that, about 75% of that volume will be geological storage. That is based on the findings of the Royal Philosophical Society of London, the International Energy Agency, MIT, Stanford, uh, and uh, the National Academies of Science. On the CO2 removal volume, about 75% of that volume will involve injecting CO2 into deep formations. So that's plenty of work to do. Uh, knowing what we know about the science and how well uh, organized it is, 
The question becomes one of policy and finance. Many people say that carbon capture is too expensive. I say that's wrong. Carbon capture is not too expensive. It is hard to finance. That is a very different thing. As an example, uh, the energy venda costs four times the cost of carbon capture. On a dollar per ton basis, that's the case. Roughly speaking, carbon capture from a point source is about $80 a ton. The energy vent is about $300 a ton. Um, uh, so it's really, it, the issue isn't cost. The energy vent supports certain kinds of technology that has served Germany very well. It has served the world very well. We like the energy vent. But in its design, it excluded carbon capture as a financing option. So unsurprisingly, Germany did not build carbon capture plants because investors couldn't get their money back. That is beginning to change. The finance is really changing quickly. Uh, in the United States, we have policies like the 45Q tax credit. That is a $50 social cost of carbon. Uh, and the current Congress has recently extended and expanded that tax credit, which is good. Uh, in California, we have the low carbon fuel standard. In Canada, there's a $170 carbon tax. In Norway, there's a $230 carbon tax. All of these will make it easier to finance carbon capture projects. In the EU, uh, things like the EU Green Deal, uh, which will help with CO2 infrastructure, uh, chiefly for things like zero carbon hydrogen production, blue and green, will help move things along as well. In the United Kingdom, a contract for difference mechanism and a uh, hub and cluster infrastructure investment program uh, are setting the stage again to improve the financing. All of that is welcome because we need the scale and we need the speed. Importantly, as the policy has expanded, the science has also expanded. There are two new topics in this space which really didn't exist five years ago. One of them is CO2 to products, uh, sometimes called carbon to value, in which you convert CO2 into saleable products. Uh, the most obvious of these is cement and concrete. Uh, you, you said that uh, 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 Mr. Whitaker was interested in making uh, uh, climate change action concrete. Well, he can make that literally concrete by putting CO2 into cement. And there's a number of companies now around the world that uh, provide that uh, service. Heidelberg Cement, Lafarge Holcim have invested in this technology specifically. You can also turn CO2 into fuels. This has become a consideration now under the Corsia standard, which is welcome. A number of companies, among them Shell, uh, have begun to invest in CO2 to fuels technology. And in fact, Jan Wurzbacher is involved in one of those. I'll let him talk about his CO2 to fuel project later. Um, in addition to carbon to value as a new science enterprise, CO2 removal is a new science enterprise. Um, even though uh, this was done at very small and local scales uh, a long time ago, the idea of engineering these systems at scale is quite new. And we're seeing companies like Climeworks appear to fill that gap. That is based on science which is emerging quickly, as well as things like uh, uh, biomass remo carbon removal and storage bikers, uh, which I can talk more about later. All of this is matched also by policy ambition. We are seeing policies, for example, in the state of New York to procure green concrete. In particular, there's one bill we've been involved in, LECLA, L-E-C-C-L-A, which sets a procurement standard for low carbon concrete. Uh, there is similar legislation going through other states in the United States, and I know is in consideration in other countries. There is an opportunity to do the same thing in procurement of low carbon fuels. I know that that is in consideration in ports around the world because ports have special authorities over fuel procurement. Uh, finally, we've begun to see the Biden administration take specific action around these things and they are, have created a whole uh, carbon removal and carbon capture platform uh, within their plans. And that is reflected in the appointments that they have made. And hopefully we will see policy on both CO2 removal and carbon capture very soon. Uh, that's my 10 minutes. I would love to talk more and look forward to the conversation with the panel. Yes, thank you, Dr. Friedman, for this brief overview. 
and I think you uh, prepared the floor quite perfectly for uh, Dr. Jan Furzbacher because uh, you mentioned Climbworks and um, their yes, work on CO2, uh, turning that into fuels already. So uh, yes, welcome Dr. Jan Wurzbacher from Climbworks. We are very excited for your statement and your views on carbon capture. Thank you very much, Gabriel. And also thanks to LSE as you for this kind invitation to, to say a few words uh, on the larger context of direct air capture here. And uh, thanks Julio for paving the way nicely as usual and giving giving a good chunk of context. And I'll hook in there directly. So uh, as, if we, as we've just learned from this overview provided by Julio, uh, there, is, there is a large need for capturing carbon in general, if we want to be in some extent consistent with our 1.5 degree global warming target. And I want to just repeat and make sure that we are really talking when, when it's about carbon capture, there are two different things. The one thing is capturing carbon from existing or in the future to be created emission sources. Uh, so that might be a, a carbon capture on power plants or on cement factories and so on. But as, as, as we've learned uh, just in the 10 minutes before, even if we did all we could, if we went all out in carbon capture from existing uh, emissions, so meaning we did everything we could do on mitigating existing emissions, switching everything to renewable power as fast as we could, this will not be enough anymore. When, when we started Climbworks even 10 years ago and even before, often people asked this either or question, should we either focus on like avoiding uh, future emissions or do we actually have to do more than that and, and remove CO2 from air? Today, this is, not, this is not the case anymore. That question doesn't make sense anymore. We, we know and science tells us it's just simple climate math that we have to do both. We have to go and uh, we have to remove these 10 or even 20 gigatons of CO2 from the air, from the atmosphere per year, from mid century or throughout as an average throughout this, uh, this century. And there are not many ways to do that. So for carbon removal, uh, there are biological methods, there are three trees, uh, soil options and so on, but many, many of these methods have limitations in terms of area uh, that they need. And then, then there is direct air capture as, as, as one tool in our toolbox. And that is where Climeworks is focusing on. Uh, maybe a few a few words of, of what we are doing. Uh, Climeworks was founded back in 2009 as a spin-off of ETH. We started two people uh, back in the days. Today, it's about 140 people, mostly based here in Zurich in our headquarters. And also we do have an office in, in Cologne in Germany with about 15 engineers in the meantime. And since then we have uh, scaled up uh, quite a bit. We started uh, really, I like to talk orders of magnitude that we were traveling through when we started in, in the very early days, we were capturing milligrams of CO2 from airstreams in the laboratory. Then we went from milligrams to grams, from grams to kilograms, from kilograms to tons, and from tons to thousand tons. Back in 2017, we built the first commercial direct air capture plant here in the vicinity of Zurich, taking at the order of a thousand tons of CO2 from the air per year and selling that to initial markets. That's uh, sold to a greenhouse and we're selling actually CO2 to Coca-Cola, who are making fizzy drinks, uh, mineral water. With the CO2. Those are niche applications. They are not climate relevant. If we served the whole worldwide market of technical CO2 with our product, that's about 30 million tons. That's, that's a match in the eternity of darkness compared to what we have to do. Uh, but it's important to start. And for us, it was, was an important start. But in the recent uh, years, we have fully focused uh, on, on our main application that we're currently doing. And that is the combination of direct air capture of CO2 with safe, permanent underground storage. Um, and we are currently doing this. Uh, so maybe one, one more uh, looking back uh, before I go to the future. In, in over the past years, we have built a total of 14 plants, uh, direct air capture plants all over Europe from the south of Italy up to the north of Iceland. So also throughout very different climate zones. And that's, I think, the most important assets that we have created for this industry. Uh, this is like, those are many, many tens of thousands of hours of operational experience uh, in, in that uh, domain. And 
Uh, well, currently all eyes are, or all the focus is again on Iceland. We started there back in 2017 with a first pilot and uh, demonstration plan. And right now you might have seen in the news some pictures, if you're interested in that topic in the last weeks, we are building our next plant that is named Orca. Uh, Orca is an animal. We like to name our plants according to animals, but also it might, means energy in Icelandic. So that's quite a nice analogy there. And this Orca plant is a 4,000 tons per year plant. So this is still very small, uh, but it's the next uh, or intermediate scale up step. Uh, so it will be online sometime in the uh, in Q2 this year and taking those 4,000 tons of CO2 out of the air. And we then hand it over to our Icelandic partners from Carbfix who are injecting the CO2 into basalt rock in Iceland, which is a very nice way of underground storage because it is the CO2 with this method is mineralized underground within a few years. So within two years, 95% of the CO2 that you have injected is turned into stone 700 meters under the ground. And that is that is so nice because in particular in Germany, we know carbon uh, capture in particular the storage aspect of CCS has been discussed a lot. There have been raised many security questions uh, and, and it's, it's, it's become a very political topic. And this is why we decided to start with a low hanging fruit to start somewhere where we can erase any doubts that might be about safety or about permanence by just turning CO2 into stone with our partners in Iceland. There are many ways on earth where you could do this process and there are many, many other ways to store CO2 in other formations. And I think one important statement, uh, Julio, if I may add that to your uh, many facts and figures and numbers that you shared with us, I think I, I'm, I'm asked often, hey, is there actually enough space to store all the CO2? And, and the answer there is, is very clear. Maybe Julio can give more detailed figures later. You are the geologist, I, I'm not. But there is like, if there's one thing which is not the bottleneck in what we need to do, it is worldwide available space to source CO2 underground. So there is more than enough space. There is like orders of magnitude times more space than we would need. And that's that's really the good news. If, in terms of what space is already developed, that's a different question. So there are lead times. If you want to source CO2 on the ground, you need, you need time for permitting, you need time for, for technical preparation, for modeling for uh, of the underground reservoirs. So that, that's a challenge. And that is where we are working on uh, heavily on, on our end to, to develop more sites. But, but this will not, not be the bottleneck, just to, to answer that question right in the beginning. Um, yes, so uh, this is this is really this is our main main focus we are currently doing. We are also there, like as Julio pointed out, another application which can um, achieve climate relevant dimensions of direct air capture is using the CO2 to produce renewable uh, synthetic fuels out of CO2. We're doing that with a couple of partners in Norway. There's a company, a project company called Norsk eFuel that has been incorporated last year with the goal of building the first plant making liquid fuel from renewable Norwegian electricity and CO2 captured from the air by 2023. Uh, that, is, that is an important application. It can serve Decarbonizing, decarbonizing those sectors that heavily do rely on liquid fuels, which are really hard to decarbonize uh, or to electrify, like public uh, public transport or short distance transport. Uh, electrification will play an important role, maybe not everywhere on, on the earth at the same speed, uh, certainly not at the same speed. But for sure, it'll take a while until air traffic or ship transportation could be electrified, if that is possible at all. So that's that's really another important element there. Um, talking about policy, and I think uh, I'll then uh, rather give us the chance to discuss more topics later before I, I spend too much time here. Uh, I think uh, Julio described it already. There are many countries and more and more starting with carbon uh, negative or net zero pledges and more and more policy instruments are rising. There are instruments now at the level of around plus minus $200 per ton, uh, which can be used to, to finance um, what we are doing to finance carbon removal projects in general. However, and this is my, my main uh, conclusion uh, or main, main important statement, we do need 
more than than what is certainly what is there now and we also do need the private sector and the private industry to to finance that uh, that gap we are currently in we are not yet at a level where we can take co2 out of the air and permanently store it for 100 or 150 dollars per ton that is where we want to get in the future but it will take a couple of more years to go there and we need to get to a million tons and multi-million ton range in order to be able to to get uh, walk down the cost curve uh, that quickly and on the way while we are going there, we need those partners, those pioneers, those customers who are saying carbon removal is an essential part of my business strategy and I'm willing to pay for that. And I'm willing to pay more than $100 or $200 for that. And very, very happy to report that a lot has happened in that sector, in that domain in the past, I would say 12 to 24 months. Uh, and if I look back over the past 11 years, what we observed at Climeworks, the last 12 months were certainly the very most exciting ones in that uh, regard. To just name one very prominent example, you might have heard of uh, the climate or carbon removal agenda of Microsoft. They have um, claimed, well, uh, big goals and we are very proud to count them now as one of our first and uh, probably most well-known customers who have purchased carbon removal service from Climeworks, uh, from the plants that are being built in Iceland currently. And we need those companies. We need companies like Microsoft, like Stripe, like, Shop like Shopify, like Audi, the German car maker, who have realized that this might be a very important element of their future business. Uh, it might not be just something as it used to be five or 10 years ago that the corporate sustainability officer is doing and decides to write one or two nice pages in their sustainability report, but it has become something that is moved to the core of the business of large corporates. And that is something um, which I hope will, will further extend and will, will um, yeah, uh, further develop and increase because we need, we need that sector together with the further and fast development of policy in order to scale fast enough as we have to do. Yes, thank, thank you. you, Dr. Wolfsbacher, for your remarks. So now we we got a, an overview um, and some figures by Dr. Friedman, and we learned that the technology, at least DAC, the direct air capture technology, did pass the field test, uh, at least for Climeworks, and now it becomes a political topic and we need to scale. So this passes the, the ball to Kai Whittaker, and um, I'm looking forward to, to your statement on carbon capture um, and, and the political view on that. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, good to be back at my uh, former university um, and great to be here on your panel. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to um, support uh, Julio in his statement that uh, since um, the IPPC reports, uh, um, much has happened in, in the sphere of politics. And especially again, after the European Union announced its um, new Green Deal uh, last year, um, which is still ne being negotiated in, in, in the European Parliament and national parliaments. But uh, just the, the initiative started knockoff effects on, in, in other countries and in other parts of the world to reconsider their strategies as well. And, um, at least given the targets they have put on in public uh, discourse. We are now down from three degrees Celsius warming up to 2.5. Now that is still not enough. We want to get go below two, two degrees, close to 1.5. Uh, but on the positive note, things are happening and moving into the right direction. Um, and uh, we did that as well in Germany. We started a climate pact last year. Um, one of the fathers of the initiative is talking to you right now. And, um, and uh, the, the special thing about this pact is that we, are, we will discuss it in Parliament annually. So there will be a review circle every year to look where are we at the moment where, what have we been doing in the past and what needs to be done in the future. Um, and uh, given that we, we are on, well, we are moving into the right direction. We could be probably a bit faster and we will be, we need to be faster given the EU um, climate targets. 
which are currently debated about 55% compared to 1990. Um, which means for Germany that we have to bring even more than 55%, around 10% more uh, uh, of a reduction in, in, in CO2 than, than the EU uh, average. So that means 65%, which is quite a lot. And uh, that will, I think, further the discussion about what we need to do. Uh, Julia already said that uh, carbon uh, storage doesn't have a good record in Germany. Um, and I think the reason is that it has, that there are two fallacies in, in, in the German public uh, discourse. Um, the first one is uh, we don't need it. And the second is it's dangerous. Um, and I just want to elaborate on those two. Um, the first one is that although Germany is is a very industrial country. We are also a very green country in terms of we have lots of forests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that gave us the impression that uh, we could actually use the forests and moors as carbon sinks. Now, um, and and this idea actually will be incorporated pretty much in the EU um, um, Green Deal. However, recent reports just um, came out. Which, which states that um, the German forests and moors are not carbon sinks, but they are actually um, um, producing CO2. Um, that is because the forests in Germany are in a very bad condition. So that even increases the pressure to reduce CO2 somewhere else. And um, that could come in handy uh, to further the course of uh, carbon storage, uh, but the discussion still is not going is is not is not has not started. Um, the other fallacy is something mis I, I I suppose that Julia and also Jan will, will just smile at, um, but germ in in the German discussion, the technology is considered as dangerous, although. It, it is not, I agree with that, I agree on that, but uh, it is not, um, it is not seen as, as, as safe in public, in the public dominion. Why is that? Well, that is a bit of a speculation to my, to me, um, but there are probably one or two historic reasons for that. First, uh, we had some 10 years ago, we had a discussion on fracking in Germany um, going on. Um, most likely in the south um, southern part of Germany near Lake Constance, uh, where we also have quite a lot of um, yeah um, high value uh, nature, and um, and that's where um, where where critics said we are going to poison uh, water and the and the flora and and, and the fauna habitat and. Um, Putting something artificially into the ground, or pumping something into the into the uh, into the ground, is is seen as something uh, technically dangerous. The other reason is has to do with uh, geothermal energy. Uh, we had some uh, of that, and also in in the southern parts of Germany, uh, with some um, well, some major consequences for the people, in, in, in particular in one village. Uh, where we have uh, seen earthquakes uh, since uh, these geothermal um, um, borings, and um, uh, that caused a lot of uh, critic uh, critique that um, if you uh, do something uh, uh, in, on, to the ground, uh, it, it will come up at some point again. So that's a very that's a speculation on my part, to be honest. But uh, Germany doesn't 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 see yet that it is a, a, a technology which is necessary, and it doesn't see it as a viable technology. Um, yet, I, as I said, pressure is mounting on Germany, and I think we should use this to restart 
um, the discussion on carbon storage. Um, given the, the, the fact that it is not a, a new rocket science, but an historic uh, science used for now nearly over uh, half a century, um, we need to uh, consider that. And especially if we say that we need to do everything to tackle climate change. I mean, if we really mean that sentence that we have to do everything, we need to consider every possible solution and cannot just um, uh, exclude it just because we don't like it. Yes, thank you, Mr. Whitaker, especially for emphasizing that we need to do everything and that we have to use all options on the table. Um, now I'd, I would like to open the floor for a fruitful discussion, hopefully. Please, um, if you are in the audience and you have a question, please use the Q&A function. Uh, you can see it on the uh, bottom right on, uh, on the icon with these uh, speaking bubbles. Um, I will try to do my best to bring up your questions. But um, to start the discussion, I would like to ask a question uh, from myself that is quite dear to my heart. Um, and this goes to uh, Dr. Friedman. Um, Dr. Friedman, you, you worked as a research scientist at ExxonMobil and uh, know the fossil fuel industry from the inside, so to say. Um, currently, most of the CCS technology investments come from big oil companies um, because they use the captured carbon for what is called enhanced oil recovery. So by pumping the captured CO2 underground in order to get more oil out by increasing the pressure underground. And over 85% of captured carbon is currently used for enhanced oil recovery. So how do we ensure that CCS uh, or carbon capture and utilization isn't misused by uh, big oil as a kind of free out of jail card um, and and an excuse not to quit fossil fuel production, uh, or at least um, to slow down the process. How, how would you, um, for, with your experience, um, what is your view on, on this issue, Dr. So Friedman? Three things on that. Uh, first of all, that is entirely up to us, period. Uh, if we want to make sure that oil companies do something, we create the market aligning incentives to do it. So as one example, in the United States, we gave no money as an incentive for saline formation storage. So the only way to get revenues was enhanced oil recovery. That's pretty simple arithmetic. Um, right now in the United States, you can get paid $50 a ton to do saline formation storage. But if you uh, sell the CO2 contract for EOR, you get paid $58 a ton. So they're close, but most companies still make money doing enhanced oil recovery. All you would need to do is increase the incentive to $60 a ton, and then they would start, they would stop doing enhanced oil recovery, and they would start doing uh, sale information. It's like, it's not that hard a thing to imagine. For the record, $60 a ton is about the same as the wind production tax credit in the United States. So it's comparable from an incentive that what we've given to wind. Solar incentives in the United States are on the order of $200 a ton. So Already again, we provide those incentives. So uh, it, all we need to do is say, we would prefer if you did a different thing, here's an incentive in the market to do it. One example of that combining regulation with incentives is the low carbon fuel standard in California, where they said, you will just stop emitting. By the way, you can use carbon capture as a compliance option. That compliance option is very valuable. It's about $200 a ton today. And it favors saline formation storage because you get a better score. So there's a lot of projects around the California low carbon fuel standard that are looking not at EOR, but at the opposite, looking at pure storage. Two other quick things that I would add to that. It's important to note that not all oil and gas companies are equal. People think that there's sort of some homogeneous block, but companies like Total and uh, Oxy, uh, uh, Occidental Petroleum have been very forward leaning they have made net zero commitments. They include those net zero commitments in their product line. They wanna have scope three net zero as well. And they've been very clear about that. They have near-term timetables. Uh, their CEOs have talked about the energy transition and they're making investments in many arenas. You know, 
people think that it's, e it's easy to throw rocks at oil and gas companies, but even there, it's quite a wide range of actors. But the, the last thing I wanna leave you with is, is sort of your starting point, which is this is not about defossilization, this is about decarbonization. We have to keep CO2 out of the atmosphere. That's the job. And if oil and gas companies continue their business but do not emit carbon dioxide, that's a pretty big change. That's a really profound shift in their business model. And the fact that somehow that is some weak effort, get out of jail free card does not make sense. They will have to invest hundreds of billions of dollars and change their practices from end to end in a net zero world. And if that's something they can do that reduces their risk and their cost and allows them to contribute, I'm in favor of it. Yes, thank you. So you said it's up to us, it's up, it's up to politics and um, that's a big field of your expertise as well. You do research on specific policy recommendations at the Center on Global Energy Policy uh, to boost and scale up CCS technologies. Um, could you maybe briefly walk us through uh, your key findings? What are specific policy um, incentives maybe that could uh, help to boost and, and scale this technology? This goes into the direction of Franca Beckmann's question. Um, she is a student at the King's College of London, Dr. Friedman. I think you are on mute, uh, excuse me. You have to unmute yourself. Thank you, apologies for that. Yes, uh, while I pull that up, let me uh, quickly add a point that uh, Jan Wurzwacher uh, had mentioned. In case people wonder, the capacity for CO2 storage in the world is 10 to 20 trillion tons of storage. 10 to 20 trillion tons. And that does not include places like Iceland. So there's plenty of things to do. In the link, in the chat function, I'm posting a study that we did at the center on policy design for CCS in the power sector. And as you said, we looked at many different policy options, including contract for differences, revenue enhancements, like a production tax credit, uh, an enhancement of 45Q, different capital treatments under the tax code, grants, and so forth. And, and there are, in fact, many options. Uh, we believe that the best pathway based on our work is to follow a revenue enhancement strategy. So something like a feed-in tariff, contract for differences, or a production tax credit, all will qualify. Um, and the reason why is because it incents the right behavior and it focuses on making products instead of capturing tons. When you do that, uh, for example, if you choose revenue enhancement, it prefers capture from natural gas plants because the revenue enhancement works best on a dollar per ton basis uh, as just one example. And I would encourage your attendees to take a look at that report and, uh, uh, and its findings. Yes, thank you. So this goes a bit into the um, direction of politics. So um, Mr. Retaker, I would like to ask you, um, how should we communicate carbon capture technologies to the public? How should the public debate evolve around this issue? And what are maybe lessons learned from the Endlagersuche in Germany, where we saw a huge opposition to store something, some waste underground? Uh, and this also goes into the direction of uh, the question by Oliver Wagner, who is a Master of Science student at the LSE. Mr. Whittaker. Well, I, for the sake of the length of this debate, I would probably not dig into the search for the uh, final spot where we put our um, nuclear waste, um, which according to law should uh, last for, I think, over 100,000 years. And that's quite ambitious for a law we make in German Parliament. But anyway, um, I think we need to, um, first of all, we should remove the um, the hurdles to actually get uh, carbon storage going in Germany. I mean, it, it is technically it's legal to do some research on that, but the but the um, the practical um, um, limitations are so 
big that you can't even do some significant research in, in Germany on carbon storage. Um, so it's actually quite a miracle that someone, somebody like Jan uh, from Germany is, is, is sitting here on this topic. Um, he's a bit of a, um, a, a rocket science engineer for that uh, matter. Um, but that would be the very first step. And I hope that um, after the election, general election in September this year in Germany, that we, which, whoever is going to govern, uh, I hope that there is a, a serious discussion on what do we need to do and what do we have to take into consideration to actually tackle climate change. And the pressure will, will rise, as I said earlier, uh, if the new Green Deal from the EU uh, comes in, uh, comes effective, and we will have to find uh, additional um, um, additional sources where to 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 uh, get to get reductions on C CO two. Uh, that would be the first thing. Second thing is probably um, that we need to combine the 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 um, the strategies on CCS in at least in the, within the European Union. Some countries are moving ahead very quickly. Uh, some countries haven't even bothered to think about it. Uh, and some countries like Germany just stay aside and, and look and wait. And I think we need a European CCS strategy, which must come along actually with the new Green Deal as a result of it. Um, that would be the second take I would, I would suggest uh, on that topic. Yes, thank you. Um, the next question uh, goes to Jan, uh, Dr. Wolfsbacher, by Benjamin Mousseau. I hope I pronounced this correctly. Excuse me if I don't. A uh, Yale student uh, from Seattle. That's nice that people are watching from the US as well. And his question goes into the direction of energy, um, especially in, in the context of direct air capture. And so the question is, what is the energy efficiency and if i understand the question right um in terms of maybe energy input to co2 saved or stored uh, in comparison to let's say green hydrogen or stuff like that uh, where you say it's about 30 percent efficiency for producing green green hydrogen when you put 100 percent solar or wind energy as an input um so what where is where is DAC there at Climeworks in terms of efficiency. And he asked a second question, do you need a, um, a constant power source or, or energy source for your filters? Or is it also okay to have a variable um, energy source? Maybe you can answer both questions. Uh, sure, I'll try, try to make it short. Efficiency is always a, a quite tricky topic when you talk about a direct air capture. Uh, the question is efficient compared, compared to what? Uh, I'll, I'll start the other way around. So for direct air capture, you do need energy. And I was sp speaking about bottlenecks before, and I said storage space is certainly not the bottleneck. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, energy supply on a global level is also not a bottleneck, a bottleneck to do uh, direct air capture, but it is significant. So, I mean, I can, can give you some, some values, but they are hard to compare, like for in, in the long term for removing a ton of CO2 from the air, you will need something like at the order of 2000 kilowatt hours uh, of, uh, of heat and electricity, depending on, on, the, on the process. And if, if you Calculate that up if you say, let's say you're removing um, 5 billion tons of CO2 from the air, this will require a substantial part of the world's renewable energy production. So let's speak about something like 10 to 20 percent of the of the renewable energy production. But but that kind of makes sense because we are building up, as, as we learned before, we are building up if, if we're doing that, if we want to solve our carbon removal requirements with direct air capture or similar technologies, we're building up an industry of the size of today's oil and gas industry. So if we are removing something like 20% of today's emissions, it kind of makes sense that we need something like uh, a similar order of magnitude of, of, uh, of uh, energy uh, or of, of the fraction of the renewable energy production. But, but it's not unfeasible, but uh, the, I like to put it the other way around, when you develop 
carbon removal technology, you need to develop renewable energy production at the same speed. That doesn't happen, have to happen at the same time. You could start a different way. And if the first five direct air capture plants on this earth, are, uh, some of them are powered by electricity from a gas power plant, well, that's not the nicest story, but but that, that might happen. But eventually it has to be, it has to be renewable energy. And then the other question was how how does it compare in terms of fuel production uh, to, to to hydrogen? There, I mean, there are many many paths. I, I will say one number: uh, when you take uh, when you produce liquid fuels via electrolyzers today, there are methods, and our German partners uh, from Dresden and from Sunfire uh, they are they are developing that or have developed that technology. You can achieve efficiencies, electricity into heating value of the fuel at the order of 70%. That is, that's quite good. Then it depends what you do with the fuel. If you burn it with 10% efficiency in a, in a car engine uh, at a bad uh, operating point, then obviously not, not, a lot, not, not a lot is left. But I would, I would then rather compare uh, you, what you have to compare is the different, really the different uh, application types. And the good thing, if you combine direct air capture, with fuel synthesis, uh, there are quite some good synergies in terms of energy coupling. So you could use the waste heat. So when you turn electricity into fuel and you have 70% of your energy in the fuel, the remaining 30% are waste heat and you can use at least a portion of that to power direct air capture. Yes, thank you, Dr. Wurzbacher. Um, we are, we're talking here about a big industries and uh, Dr. Friedman, you mentioned the cement industry and steel industry. These are huge companies uh, usually, and we also mentioned the big oil companies already. Um, now I have a question by Ralph Schmidt to both Dr. Wurzbacher, you and uh, Dr. Friedman, if you want to add something later, uh, concerning mid-sized or small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, how would carbon capture be beneficial accessible and economically attractive to these small or medium sized enterprises or is it merely a topic for big corporations if maybe you could start dr Wurzbacher, and then maybe i can hand over to friedman dr friedman i can give a very simple answer i can uh, symbolically <laughs> share the list of our customers so uh, those people who currently pay uh, or those Parties that pay Climeworks to remove CO2 from the air really range from corporates, big corporates like Microsoft, down to individuals. So any individual could go to our website and purchase a carbon removal subscription, and we have everything in between. It really depends on the sector. I would not uh, relate it to the type of company. What we have observed that in this phase, where we require pioneers, what what uh, we are like removing carbon at the level where it's still more expensive is particularly interesting for those um, companies and those could be SMEs uh, or large corporates um, or very small companies who are in the service sector because uh, they have rather small emissions and a huge business value attached to it which can be uh, related to marketing or other issues so their customers might might urge them to do something to, to be carbon neutral or even carbon negative and they can afford it on the other hand if we were speaking to a cement producer it would at, at current cost levels it, it just wouldn't work out so we couldn't remove all their, their emissions and it wouldn't make sense because there are other ways of, of, of doing that so i really see it all over all over the uh, sizes it's rather a question of which are the sectors that are most likely to start and take action julio uh, thank you so let me start by saying this is an opportunity for everybody to pitch in everybody gets to help everybody gets to work Right now, the issues associated with small and medium enterprises taking part are a function basically of infrastructure and a function of financial models. And so innovating financial models and building infrastructure will allow more people to take part. It's kind of that simple. It hasn't been done because there hasn't been these policies that align in the marketplace, but that's beginning to happen. So let me give you three examples for small and medium-sized companies. One of them, innovation. Uh, as much as I love Climeworks, and I do, they are not the only company who is creating carbon capture technology or direct air capture technology or anything else. I saw one of the questions talked about biochar. Uh, there are companies that make fast pyrolysis machines and fast pyrolysis devices make biochar and can capture CO2 from biomass. So there's interesting things to do out there. 
And for many of, of the, the foundational innovations will come from these small and medium companies, that's good industrial policy too. So for a company like Germany or any other country, they can start thinking about how to incentivize small innovators so that they have a domestic innovation industry. Second, for companies that have small emissions volumes, say 50,000 tons a year um, uh, or, or 100,000 tons a year, there's no way they can do carbon capture until the infrastructure is built. Uh, and here, that infrastructure might be pipelines, say down the Ruhr Valley, it might be barges down the Rhine. But either way, they need to take the CO2 out. It is not reasonable to imagine that a small company will pay to build its own pipelines and its own shipping. That just won't happen. That is a good use of public policy. The United Kingdom has been very forward in this. They are putting out a competition for four industrial hubs and clusters, 800 million pounds with four winners. That infrastructure will help everybody in those industrial hubs and clusters, no matter how big or how small the company is. Um, and as the costs of carbon capture drop, it will be more reasonable for a small company to start thinking about buying those services because the costs will become more reasonable. Finally, there's been a lot of innovation in the finance and investment circles around renewable power. So for example, people have begun to make pools to buy renewable power. So if you're a small company, it might be hard for you to put together a contract for renewable electricity. And so there's these power purchase agreements and buyer, buyers clubs and power pools and so forth. That is a business model innovation that has allowed more companies to buy renewable power. You can imagine the same sort of thing for carbon capture, where people who have small volumes or little bits of money or who want to finance large projects but can't afford the entire thing on their balance sheet, they could potentially pool resources and then they can be credited through some crediting mechanism. That will require financial innovations, regulatory innovations, contracting innovations. That's good work. We need lawyers, we need business people, we need everybody getting involved in this. And there are real business opportunities for reimagining how to bring small and medium enterprises into this arena. Yes, thank you, Dr. Friedman. Um, now we talked a bit about, or quite a bit, about the demand for carbon capture technologies, about the technical feasibility and the role of politics uh, to scale this up. And if we now look into the far future and we have indeed achieved what we need to achieve and we have uh, huge amounts of carbon capture and storage um, that we with, that we sequestrate underground, uh, then a question uh, comes up that Corina Teresa Schwartz from the TU Vienna um, brought up. What will happen um, to the CO2 that we stored underground in in the afterlife or in in the in the in the long term? And I could add to this question my own question. Who's liable or, or accountable for CO2 accidents, uh, similar to maybe oil spills? Um, I mean, you could have uh, CO2 spills with huge costs for countries that are most affected by climate change impacts. Who would pay for this? Uh, and do you can we work with insurance companies uh, to to hold uh, yeah companies accountable? Right. Or so this one's this, easy. Yeah, it goes to the whole really panel. Uh, uh, first of all. Uh, Hollywood has done us all a disservice. People imagine that there will be some eruption of CO2, like, no, not physically possible. Like, rocks have mass and strength. That never happens, ever. Uh, second of all, there are already financial instruments and insurance instruments out there. Swiss Re, Zurich Re, Prudential, Lloyd's, they already offer CO2 insurance for very long period storage. Third, I want all those insurance companies to call me because I want to get in the CO2 insurance business because it is getting paid to do nothing. CO2 storage is incredibly safe. We have put 300 million tons of CO2 underground strictly for the purpose of climate. The number of people who have been harmed is zero. The volume of CO2 that has been leaked is zero. Um, and in fact, the Earth's crust is very well configured to store CO2. Over time, unlike nuclear waste repositories, CO2 waste repositories become safer over time. CO2 dissolves and this is no longer buoyant. It mineralizes into rocks like it does in Iceland. Uh, uh, 
like the idea of some catastrophic relief of release of CO2 is simply fiction. It is not science. And in that context, I certainly hope that we will get people comfortable with this through demonstration. When we have hundreds of these projects around the world, everyone will go, oh, I guess it was no big deal. Yes, thank you. Um, one last question maybe to Mr. Whittaker. Um, how can we accelerate the, the planning and permitting phase of CCS projects in Germany maybe in particular? Um, and what are other political obstacles um, that you currently see? Um, do we maybe need a CCS law similar to the EEG law for renewables market entry and, and penetration in 2000? What, what are your views how to scale this up from the political view? Uh, well, answering your first question, what do we need to, to do? We need to, do, we need to change laws. It's as simple as that. Um, and we need to find majorities in parliament to, 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 to change these laws. And um, actually that is what I guess we will be fighting as well. I mean, I'm, I'm working on, 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 on the, on the fact that we as, cons as CDU, as uh, Christian Democrats, that we are lobbying for CCS, um, which is still even a controversial topic um, within my party, but it is least controversial compared to all others. Um, and uh, we will uh, lobbying for this. Uh, I hope so also in the election. Um, and then we need to find uh, a majority afterwards. I hope we can um, form a new government uh, in October this year. And uh, if it may be with the Green Party, that will be a very tough discussion with them because um, they are not so much focusing on new technologies. They're much more focusing on uh, taking away uh, existent uh, uh, technologies. And that is a bit of a problem because you, if you if you just take one option away and you have no option to go to to the future, um, you 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 lock yourself up in a completely um, um, in in a position which is not uh, which is not sustainable in, for the future. Um, so that's what we we need to talk about. If again, as I said at the at the beginning, if we want to tackle climate change and if we want to do everything to do that. We need to consider every technology. And CCS, CCS is one of many options on the table uh, and it should be regarded as such and not as, a, as an outlier or um, a bad child which, which, uh, which is ex excluded from the family. Um, that is pretty much it. Um, if I may, just more personal remark, I saw the question of Ralph Schmidt, um, a CEO of a mid-sized uh, pharmaceutical company. I believe that pharmaceutical company is in my constituency because I know to, I happen to know a Ralph Schmidt from that company. Not quite sure if he is that guy, but I'm, I would be surprised if there's a second Ralph Schmidt in Germany on a mid-sized pharmaceutical company. So if you go for that, uh, Mr. Schmidt, I will support you. Yeah, I will support you on that. Mm -hmm. Let me add one thing quickly to that. Uh, if you want to buy CO2 removal services, go to Jan. He can do it. Uh, and if you want a wider set of options, uh, I would encourage you to come to Carbon Direct. Carbon Direct is one of the companies that helped Microsoft pull together its portfolio. And if you need political support, go to Mr. Whittaker. So thank you to the whole panel, to the three of you for making the time. It was a very interesting and exciting conversation. I wish we had more time, but unfortunately we need to close the session. Sorry if I didn't get to your question. If uh, your question didn't get an answer in, in the chat box, maybe you could write an email to the panelists. I don't know. Um, yes, thank you all and have a great evening and stay safe, safe and healthy. Goodbye. Thank, thank you all. You.